the last remaining wild places on Earth. Primordial, timeless, untouched by humans. But are they as pristine as we think? Ancient cities in the heart of the Amazon. The most iconic wild places shaped by man. Is wilderness just a figment of our imagination? How natural is the natural world? Nowhere speaks of wild nature more powerfully than the savannas of East Africa. And here one place has become iconic, Serengeti. For many, Serengeti is the embodiment of wild Africa. The Serengeti is that which is infinite, that which is tremendous, that which is beyond control. But is this place what it seems? A national park is typically an, an, an artificial setup. It's just a zoo magnified. Is this primordial wilderness as timeless and unchanging as we imagine? There's an assumption that if you put a line around a park, it's going to stay like that. Nothing stays the same. Is Serengeti as natural as we think? Humans did have a very big influence in shaping the savanna fauna and almost certainly the plants as well. Behind the popular image of a pristine wilderness hides a far less natural history. A story that charts the fortunes of hunters and hunter-gatherers, of devastating disease, war, and battles for political dominance. Taking us right back to the origin of our species and the very nature of existence. The story of how a particular view of the wild came to shape Africa. In 1957, a small zebra-striped aeroplane left Frankfurt in Germany on a 6,000-mile journey to East Africa. Inside was Bernhard Chimek, the curator of Frankfurt Zoo, and his son Michael, their mission to save the Serengeti. The Serengeti in Tanganyika is a wilderness of about 8,000 square miles. That is practically the size of Northern Ireland, and yet the Serengeti is one of the seven wonders of this earth. To the east lies the plateau of the giant crater. The Ngorongoro crater is the most magnificent natural zoo on earth. God created it for himself and fenced it in with mountain walls 1800 feet high to protect its inhabitants. The Serengeti at that time was headline news. It had recently been made a national park to protect its natural wonders. But the British colonial government had just announced plans to make the park smaller, to allow more room for a rapidly expanding human population. When the Jimex went to the Serengeti in 1957, there was a controversy brewing over the borders of the national park. The British colonial government decided to create a, um, a, a conservation area that would include Maasai herders and separate that off from another part of the park that would be devoted solely to, to the animals. Though animals would still get some protection, leading conservationists the world over were up in arms. They opposed any reduction in size of what they saw as Africa's last great wilderness and in particular, the removal from the National Park of the spectacular Ungorogoro crater. Bernhard Chimek was determined to prove the case for a bigger National Park. 
He believed the key lay in the world-famous wildebeest migration. Serengeti's annual migration is a true wonder of the natural world. Two million wildebeest, along with 500,000 zebra, following the rains across two countries. You encounter an immensity that you almost imagine cannot be real. So many wildebeest and everything moving towards a certain direction. And you're also overwhelmed by the sense of mystery, the vastness, the awesomeness. The wildebeest migrations happen in a pattern that's linked to uh, the patterns of rain and desiccation on the Serengeti. Their young, as well as those of zebra and gazelle, are prey for a number of the iconic predators, lions, hyena. So then since they're an indicator for the broader health of that entire ecosystem. The migration is so famous today, it's difficult for us to imagine that as recently as the late 1950s, almost nothing was known about it. Bernhard Chimek believed that the colonial government's new plans to cut Serengeti in half would leave the wildebeest completely unprotected for a large part of the year. He was deeply concerned that this would spell the end for Serengeti's wildlife. With the plane, Chimek would be the first to follow the migrating herds and to prove that Africa's wild animals needed more space to survive. The plane was also the key to bringing a completely new and dramatic perspective on Serengeti. The film Serengeti Shall Not Die would show the splendor of this wilderness as never before and bring the plight of the Serengeti to the world. And so he became, if you like, the voice of Serengeti. He became the one that went out there to the Western world, to North America and so on, through his films, to say, Serengeti is in trouble. This is the greatest place on earth. And what we don't know, it's about to be lost very quickly. And Chimek would show the world what he perceived to be the real threat to Serengeti's survival, humans. It was this last great Eden, so to speak, which he championed. But at the same time, it was this dark, stalking menace in the background, which is about to overwhelm it. And so he put those things together very effectively to create a crisis of the Serengeti. The bigger argument was these natural uh, wonders have to be capped against these hordes of human predators, if you will. And 